You are listening to the Fresh Take Network, SIF interview exclusive. What it is, what it is, what Fresh Take, Joshua Adam Weimar with Kat Jamie. Jamie is the documentarian from the latest Finding the uh, Finding Big Country and this fantastic Vancouver Grizzlies doc. Thanks so much for coming on, Kat. Thanks for having me, Joshua. So uh, just kind of first to get started here, just the one thing I really loved about this was just showcasing your love of basketball. And, you know, coming from where we are in Calgary and being around basketball as long as I've been, the Filipino culture, particularly such a love of basketball. And you could feel that arch in. And that's the one thing I really loved about it right away was showcasing your story and talking to your brother and to your dad. And getting that feel of your love before you even get to the Vancouver Grizzly side of love, it was just talking about your love yeah. of basketball. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, uh, you know, my previous film, Finding Me Country, we kind of delved deep into my personal story. Um, and here with, with the Grizzly Truth, you know, we, we knew we needed to do the same, but how do we do it? That's different than finding the country. And I, I knew right away what the, you know, what part of my story I wanted to share um, because it really, um, you know, in finding the country, it was sort of like my connection to Bryant, but this one really talked about why, like, why did I love the Grizzlies so much? Um, and, you know, I, we go and we, we explore sort of like, you know, my Filipino Canadian identity, um, what it, what it's like growing up in Canada as a second generation, like um, Canadian, um, which I know a lot of other, you know, I, I knew that this this story and my personal story might be relatable to other other Canadians, um, and and that was true. Like you know, I uh, on this journey, like I meet a bunch of other Grizzly super fans who share similar stories of why they connected to to the Grizzlies in basketball. You know. You know, Canada is known as a hockey country, but not all of us, you know, grew up playing hockey. Um, I, I did at one point, but I definitely like I haven't I, ha you know, I have an older brother. And when he was into hockey, I was into hockey, he hit a baseball phase and then I got into baseball. But then, you know, the 90s hit and Michael Jordan was like everywhere and every kid like, you know, wanted to be MJ, including my brother. And so that's how I got into basketball. And it just came like this like the um, basketball just came naturally to me. Yeah, what was that day of like the announcement of the Grizzlies coming, like the excitement that was in your guys' household? Yeah, it was uh, super exciting. Like, I still have like vivid memories of like being told like, okay, after dinner, like we're going to a, a Grizzlies game. And I was like so excited. I remember I had this like Chicago Bulls like backpack. And I remember being so excited, like getting my Chicago Bulls backpack. And like, I don't know where I, what I put in it, but I just remember like wanting to take this backpack and like going to games. Like it was so much fun. Like it was really so ma like magical is the word I always use to describe Grizzly games. And that sort of like that time uh, uh, in period of, of my childhood going to games because um, it was just, yeah, the, the Grizzlies did a great job <laughs> at like catering and marketing to, marketing to little kids. Um, and, you know, we're all, you know, in our, I, I've spoken to again, so many super fans were now like all in our, you know, 30s. Um, and we're like, man, like we would be season ticket holders, you know, if we had a team. And like that was kind of the plan all along. It's like, yeah. let's really sell like let's let's make these kids fall in love with it so when they're older like they'll become our season ticket holders and it would have worked they they really did a good job planting that seed i should say some some of the footage we got to see if you play nice jumper very quality jumper it's Thank a shame you. that ubc <laughs> that that they did go the way they went because it was a solid j <laughs> uh, I, I appreciate that but yeah yeah, I, I really love the jumper. Uh, one of the cool things at the beginning was the, the the support group. And I think that was so crucial to have the support group. You know, when I've been able to travel and you see some of these NBA teams that have left, when I've gone to Vancouver and I've worn my Grizzlies hat, it's always love. Same when I've gone to Seattle. If you have a Sonics hat in Seattle yeah. they, or anywhere, people go crazy for those two hats, for the Sonics hat and for the Grizzlies hat, because they feel both those teams yeah. more or less were kind of robbed of their NBA franchises. Mm -hmm. So having that support group for the Grizzlies, mm -hmm. from what I've kind of seen being in those cities and traveling, it was very, very relatable. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, yeah, I've always, uh, after finding the country, I met like a, 
so many fans that love the team as much as I did and who I met so many fans who were heartbroken just as much as I was that the team wasn't that what that the team left so when I was making the Grizzly Truth I always had this scene in my head I was like why don't we why don't we get everyone together like why don't we just like get a bunch of Grizzly fans together get us talking about the Grizzlies showing memories um and just see what happens and it uh yeah it was very cathartic I feel like it was the team up and left like that's what it feels like the team up and left and we just never got a chance to celebrate the team and so I felt like that was a really um that was super like that was so uh important for all of us and I feel like it 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 was like it it gave everyone a little bit of closure in a way as well that that's that scene in actuality like was a three-hour scene that we filmed but it's obviously like not that long in the film you could feel it, and I thought it was so funny when the guy comes in with the John Morant jersey, and it was like, <laughs> yeah. And we'll talk about your your trip to Memphis too, but it was just like that was a guy that's like, hey, like I still feel bad, but I've kind of moved on a little bit. I'm still like, I'm still kind of embracing yeah. things, and I think that goes to the bigger picture of your Memphis trip. We'll talk about in a second. Uh, the other thing was, so you just got. I think finding Big Country was so great, and I again would suggest everyone watch that documentary. It's so so well done. Uh, did that open a little bit of a portal to you to be able to talk to some of these M- other NBA players, like getting to talk to Sharif and Barron and all th- some of these names that I had, you know, not heard for a while, like Othella Harrington and all these names. It was like, oh, these are just classic mm-hmm. NBA hang time or old school NBA live games I used to play or watching the NBA back then, hearing some of those names. Yeah, no, for sure. NBA Jam. Um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, Finding Me Country really helped open doors for me um, because when I, you know, when I met, like, cold message, cold called, cold texted, emailed, Instagram message, LinkedIn, like, like all wow. the ways to, like, possibly connect with these players, I did. Um, and it was like, you know, I, I made a film, like, in my message, it'd be like, I made a film called Finding Me Country. Here's a link. Um, now my dream is to tell the full story of the Vancouver Grizzlies. And so, yeah, that, you know, Finding My Country really helped open doors. Um, if if they did watch it, like, they got to see a bit of who I was, because obviously Finding My Country, that's, that's my story is kind of mixed in there with Brian's. Um, and, you know, it, it gave me credibility. It gave me, like, it, it showed, like, okay, like, I, 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 got, I got one player on board. Um, and, you know, within Finding Big Country, there are other people who, like, I talked to Lionel, Lionel Holland, I talked to Stu Jackson, I talked to Mike Bibby. So there, there are people in in that uh, film who also helped, you know, um, that I was able to get because of Finding Big Country. And even, even uh, there are a lot of, like, grizzly workers who all the players love, like Debbie Butt, who uh, was director of media relations. She's in both mm. films. And all the players, like if there's one person that everyone remembers, it's Debbie. Um, and so I, I definitely use that, uh, you know, as like an icebreaker, like, you know, Debbie and the, everyone would be like, oh, I love Debbie, you know. De- um, so that was, uh, you know, as, as soon as you kind of got like one player and one person from the Grizz organization on board, it was a much easier sell to be like, OK, yeah, like, you know, Debbie's part of the project and Brian's part of the project. And then, you know, once you have that, it's easier for other people to say, yeah, sure. Like I, I want to be a part of this too. I think it's so important. You mentioned someone like a Debbie, because I think the one thing that people think when these teams leave, it's like, yeah, the fans are sad, but it's like, there's people that are losing their jobs, which is a, a, a yeah, overarching yeah. thing that people aren't thinking about. So getting someone on her is so important because this is someone that worked for the franchise that obviously moved on, but there's other people that lose their jobs. And it's a nice reminder that, Hey, like this is more than just, yeah, some players are leaving to another team and yeah, some people aren't having fans to cheer from there's real stakes at hand. No, for sure. And like, um, you know, there is people who, you know, I've talked, spoken to dancers who uh, from the extreme dance team who like, you know, wanted to get into like sports, you know, marketing or sports management. Um, and the Grizzlies were like, you know, and, and I've also talked to super, like, you know, super fans who wanted to work um, on the NBA side, a super fans who wanted to play for the Grizzlies. And the, so the Grizzlies were like, they were a dream for many of us um, to continue our love of basketball, um, business, sports. Um, and so when they left, like, we, you're right. Like we didn't just leave, we didn't just lose like, some you know a team of basketball players we lost like i feel like we lost a lot um yeah. and there's still a big void um 
that I know I, I hope this film kind of you know gives gives fans closure but also gives us a chance to celebrate the Grizzlies which we've not been able to do yeah I think that was the main part of it you get to have that celebration of this team and getting to showcase off some of those players as well I think the interesting thing too is when you go there you kind of get the two markets of when people like you know the casual side is like what happened to the Grizzlies and it's some people will say Stu Jackson some of the drafts and some people will say C. Francis and then you know and then obviously the Canadian dollar and all that I think those are the three points and I think that was the good part of that meeting did that come up casually or was that kind of like hey we kind of want to go around this I sorry talking about Stu Jackson or Steve Francis uh well from the meeting like for all those like the main points for the the three things you had to hit on in the meeting with Stu Jackson Steve Francis and the and the and the dollar and it came up all in the meeting so it was like kind of a nice little template to lead into the dollar oh I see yeah 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 for sure that yeah that happened kind of naturally um because of course those like the three you know there are other things that people kind of argue about like you know uh, but those are like the three main things that uh are, are arguments for why the grizzlies left town and so um so yeah it was it was you know it's great that that kind of came up naturally in the in the, in that group therapy meeting um, cause that's kind of, yeah, that's kind of what we base our, like the structure of the film. If you, yeah, if you want to call it that. So, and then going to meet Steve Francis, uh, obviously a lot, you know, like a lot goes into that, right. Of this is the guy that has been villainized by the franchise for the longest time, but has never told his story, not in any podcast, not in any YouTube video. It's pretty crazy. You know, with all the NBA podcasts that we have out there, you would have thought eventually, this would have came out and you finally kind of have the story to tell that. And you could tell when you went mm -hmm. to Houston to do it, there was a little bit of excitement, a little bit of nervousness, all kind of mixed up in one. Yeah. Um, so the funny thing about that story, I mean, you can't tell this story without Steve Francis. Um, and I, uh, um, I actually got in touch with Steve like a few years ago and I sent him a message on Instagram and I said, Hey, again, like, my my whole spiel um and i sent him a link to finding the country and he watched it he liked it and he said he was interested in being part of this this project and i was so excited um but then i but then he kind of ghosted me um and after many failed attempts to try to get in touch with him again i was unsuccessful but i knew just from reading things online reading uh social media posts that i'd seen him comment on i was like i know that he'd want to be a part of this because we are going to be talking about him and and i know that he'd want to his voice in this you know and like he's so tied whether vancouver fans like want to recognize this or not he's he's part of the franchise right and so yeah. um you he has to, like so he his voice has to be included in this um and so uh i was yeah my team and i were trying to figure out like social media campaigns to get it like get his attention like who like i have i think one of my brainstorming sessions i could find a piece of paper but it was like you know who how do i get to steve francis and like just like writing everyone that i knew who might possibly like you know that might maybe have a teammate that had a teammate that like you know what i mean like just like okay how do i get in touch with them but my uh, our researcher Gerald was uh, is also great um, you know great at researching great at sleuthing and he found that he that Steve had this like autograph signing in Houston and this was on so we get the message on Monday that's like Steve has this like Steve has this uh, autograph signing on Saturday so it's Monday and so like I call my producer really quickly and I'm like Michael like you gotta get I, I need to <laughs> you need to send me to Houston like I need to go here um and it was yeah it was nerve-wracking like I was nervous at the same time like I was just happy to have the opportunity to try to talk to him like I knew that's kind of all I that's what was important for this film and if he said no it would have sucked but at least we would have got you know we we go we would have captured me trying to talk to Steve and that's really all I needed um and you know the stars aligned um and when i got my like five minutes to pitch him like i'm stuttering like crazy like when i start yeah. talking to him because i am super nervous um but he like he thankfully says yes and like we had I, like my options were like 
if you like whatever you have i'll take so if it's like 10 minutes now after you do this these signings we 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 had another day booked the following day just in case steve was like okay fine like i'll do it and i'll do it tomorrow i'll do an interview tomorrow so we had a crew lined up but he was like no like let's like he wanted to do it another time, which is great because he then invited us to DC where he where he grew up, and that's so we finally like got we got his story, um, and you know it was great, and I very I'm very grateful that he invited you know me and my team down there for us to sh to see where Steve Francis grew up, and I think that's really important for Vancouver Grizzly fans um, to understand like his backstory. You kind of have to see you know see these players not just as nba superstars but like as he says like as real human beings yeah and you know got to hear his draft story that he hadn't really shown to anyone that hey i thought i was going to chicago like that they kind of promised me i was going there so i kind of got caught off yeah. guard by going to vancouver and there's a whole ball that rolls hey would the grizzlies have gotten elton brand then and we're not gonna play what ifs because that's not what this documentary is about but it's really interesting to kind of see the side of where he came. And I think the villainization of him kind of drifted back a little bit, especially when he tells the story of his grandma and all that. And you see like, Hey, again, kind of talking about the, the management side of the Grizzlies. Hey, this is a real person that has real issues. It sucks that he didn't come to your basketball team, but there was real issues at play. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. And hopefully, yeah, the, hopefully the film, you know, clarifies that and clears the air and shows you know just like we do with finding big country like just you know we we like to scapegoat as as fans when you love yeah. something so much um and it gets taken away from you um in a way that you don't understand like you come up with these reasons in your head but it's like okay well you know things aren't just black and white things are more complicated than than they may seem and, you know, this, the story of the Grizzlies is so complicated. It's so it complicated. Is. And there's a lot that happens in six years. A few other complicated things as we get near the end here. Stu Jackson and those drafts, right? And we, we've done a podcast here when we went through all those drafts. And there's a lot of what ifs. But again, this isn't about what ifs. And just getting to talk to him and hearing his side. And you, you do understand, again, how hard it is to run a basketball team. You, you do question some of the decisions that happen. I'm sure as a Grizzlies fan, you did at the time, right? Uh, what went in and how was that uh, conversation with Stu and like, where were you going in with the directive to ask? Mm -hmm. Again, I think um, I, as a documentary filmmaker, um, you know, you have to approach these subjects as like, or not subjects, they're people, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Like, and so there are a lot of fans who are, you know, very upset at like Steve at Stu, but it's like, but you have to, you know, you can't go into an interview like guns blazing. Um, and by that time, I'd, I'd spoken to so many people who work for the Grizzlies that I, I understood Stu's decisions. Um, and so you kind of have to, it's, you know, a fine line between like empathy and understanding, um, but also like asking the questions that fans, you know, that fans want answered um but uh but yeah by the time i i met with Stu, i already knew like i i i didn't need him to convince me if that makes sense i i understood and i agreed with um you know a lot because i by that time I'd, I'd spoken to larry riley who was like who was um Stu's, you know one of the three it was like Stu, larry riley and i forget who the other person is but like one of the one of the top guys who drafted uh, all these players and Larry Riley, you know, later, like years later in his career, drafts Seth, uh, uh, Steph Curry um, and Clay Thompson. So it's like, you know, these, it's not like these, these guys don't know what they're doing. They clearly do. Um, but it is like, as Paul Jones says, says it in his interview, it's like luck. Luck has, luck is a huge part of this whole equation. Um, and, you know, you have to, you have to do your research, but you also have to have luck. And that's the same as anything in life, right? Like, you know, uh, I can, I can, you know, attribute so many things that have gone my way to like, yes, it was a lot of hard work, but it was also luck. Luck has to yeah. be on your side. Well, and they got that and the draft handicap thing, which I had no idea about. And you look at that 95 draft, it's like, mm. well, yeah, they could have drafted Kevin Garnett that could have changed a lot of things. And yeah. I think a Charlotte Bobcats, for example, when they went to expansion, they didn't have to deal with it. Now they struggled, 
So that's not a great example, but mm -hmm. still it showed like how hard out that the Grizzlies were to, you know, try to draft the best talent they can while also having this handicap against them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that uh, really, those rules really uh, hurt us um, for sure. And then the last piece of the pie was the financial situation. And I thought that was such an important situation because that's a side that not a lot of people talk about as much. And I thought when you were in that economics class and talking to the professor and you asked about the Raptors, and I think that's what a lot of people were asking, right? Is like, well, why did the Raptors not fail? And I thought that interview was one of my favorite ones because it gave a lot of clarity to people that had been asking those questions and can't just find those with a simple Google search and simply like, well, it's because of Vince and it plays a part into it. But there was a lot of interesting information in that that I had no idea about. Mm -hmm. I mean, the main thing that I learned, yeah, was that the Raptors was owned by the Teachers Pension Fund in Toronto. Yeah, and like I that, uh, yeah, I mean, so it was like, not only did they have luck, but they had like way bigger, again, as John Pito says, like, like they had uh, like bigger uh, financial backing behind them. So they could kind of weather, weather those storms of the lockout and of, you know, this and that. And so, you know, I think it's, that is a, a bit understated. Um, and I think, you know, he does say like, it's a cheap, like the Canadian dollar is a cheap excuse, but you know, it's a cheap excuse if you have like the Canadian, the teacher's pension fund behind you. So it was a mix of that and the, and Vince and drafting Vince Carter. It was both those things. But then you can't like with Vince Carter, like we got baby that year. And like, that's arguably like, you can't, you know, everyone wants to like, point the finger at Stu and his team for the draft picks but you know Sharif was a great draft pick Bibby was a great draft pick Steve Francis was a great, it was a great draft pick and just things just didn't fall our way well and even in that trade they got Michael Dickerson who was a really good player and a lot of people forget about yeah. how good Michael Dickerson was and then injuries unfortunately ruined his career and like unsimilar to Bryant but not a lot of people remember Bryant uh dicker remember michael dickerson he was a really good player and you kind of talked about it, it was like they were getting better every year and you look at that lineup of like bibby and michael dickerson and sharif and reeves it's like it's really and then i think the hardest thing the two last things here and i know you're kind of time is you look at that memphis draft the next year and it's like they got pau gasol and shane battier and it's just like oh yeah. my god really yeah yeah uh, but the, what what's interesting is like you know it took time for the grit and grind era uh, yeah. to to happen. So it wasn't like an overnight success in Memphis either, right? Like it no. took time, and so you know you kind of have to think of like what you know what would have happened had we just you know well I would be I would be out of, of a job <laughs> like <laughs> like I would have made made happy films fan. right? But, uh, yeah, I'd be, I'd be a happy fan. Yeah, maybe I'd be making following the team in a different way, but. You know, I just six years again, like this someone says this in the film, six years just isn't enough time. There just wasn't no. enough time. My favorite yeah. part, and I, I'm not a guy that gets emotional during films very often, but when you went to Memphis and you're walking with the fa outside of the of, of the FedEx and you had your flag yeah. on and people were recognizing, I could tell how much it meant to you. And even just as a basketball yeah. fan, as a Canadian basketball fan, that was a really powerful scene, I thought. And you could if you're if you know, just being watching Canada basketball grow and seeing what the Grizzlies lost and knowing the setup you had as a fan and then seeing like, Oh, people do recognize that it is the Vancouver Grizzlies and there is a respect here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, I was, you know, happily surprised that everyone knew like this team is from Vancouver and it's nice to, you know, I, and one of the th cool things is like, there are a few, like there are Vancouver Grizzly things, uh, that are like that are kind of part of memphis's history so for example like um they wave towels like that's a that's a vancouver thing yeah. um during the playoffs um memphis does that that they got that from vancouver because vancouver people who worked for the for the vancouver grizzlies moved to memphis and introduced that right um so that's like one thing a lot of the records that players still hold they still include like Sharif, um, big country, like, because it's still part of their history. And I guess the main thing, and, you know, I used to kind of not like this, but they're, they kept the name. And I know <laughs> Vancouver Grizzly fans won't be happy that I'm saying this, but like, that is, they didn't, they didn't, 
um because you know you know i've always said like you know prior to making this film like i want the grizzlies back in vancouver and i yeah. you know i can't really say that anymore but like they it's not like they took took the team and and like made it something else there is still a connection to the memphis grizzlies um for many reasons and like one of the reasons is the name they kept the name and so you know i i think one of the cool things about this film is like it, the mentality has always been like an us versus them when it comes to like vancouver and memphis yeah. um but when i went there it was like like it wasn't that and it, it was like it was like these are the this is the enemy that i've been you know that i thought was the enemy this entire time and like they welcomed me with open arms like you know i got to shoot like the cannon i met um I had met some people over social media and I was like bumping into them in, in the halls. And, you know, it was just like, you know, the, the sport can bring people together um, in your community or like across like countries, you know, um, and that little boy, Antonio is just like, awesome. I always say he was, uh, yeah, he's the, he's the guy who like makes the Grinch's heart grow three times uh, <laughs> its size. Um, yeah. Cause yeah, like why, why can't we share this? And once he said that, once he was like, why can't we share the team? I was like, you know, like, yeah, why why can't we share the team? So, I don't know. It was it was really special. Like that trip is really special. And I, after going through that, I was like, okay, Vancouver Grizzly fans, if you're if if you're a Vancouver Grizzly fan that's still heartbroken and bitter, like, just go to Memphis. It's going to be really confusing. Like I was very confused like the entire time I was there, yeah. but it was it really meant a lot to see, um, you know, to see how much the team is loved there. Was it on purpose that it was a Naismith Cup game, technically? Raptors that was luck. Like, it was oh, kind yeah. of, we, we, we were supposed to go to Memphis, like, in 20, 2020. I think it was, like, February or March. Like, a week, a week before everything shut down. We were supposed okay. to go, and we had booked tickets for this game, for yeah. the... Um, for the Raptors and they were supposed to wear their throwback jerseys on like that game. So, oh, uh, yeah, God. it was, uh, it was, it was really good, but, um, it just so happened that the, the block that we had to film was, was when the Raptors was in, were in town. So yeah, the stars aligned for, for us there too. Cause that was really cool to, to watch like, you know, the Raptors versus the Grizzlies. Yeah, classic Naismith Cup. The the uh, la few last things I'll let you go. Uh, the Grizzlies having the two Canadian players on their team with Dylan and with Brandon. Was there any thought of trying to maybe get the to do an interview with them and talk about their thoughts on the Vancouver Grizzlies? Yeah, we we actually did an interview with Dylan Brooks. Okay. Um, it just doesn't make the cut, so maybe it'll be in like an an extended scene later on. But but he was I was very grateful because he did sit down with me. Um, you know, I think it was like after practice, he was able to come sit down, do a quick, quick sit down interview, uh, like, you know, 20 minutes or so. Um, and so, yeah, we got his take on, on the Grizzlies and, you know, what it means for him as a Canadian, uh, athlete to be playing for the Memphis Grizzlies. And I think it's really important too, for the Memphis side is the jaw was so open about wanting those jerseys back too. jaw had that social media mm -hmm. campaign about making sure that they got those jerseys. So I guess, are you a Memphis Grizzlies fan now? Or are you just like, cool that they're there and happy for their fans? No, I would, I mean, um, <laughs> that's a good question. I, I would say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Memphis fan. I'm a Memphis fan. Um, but you know, I still, I still want a team for Vancouver. Like, it's not that I'm a Memphis fan and I'm like, things are all good. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm happy, uh, that, that the Grizzlies are loved in Memphis. I'm happy that we're still remembered there. And I acknowledge that, uh, you know, as much as I feel like it's my team, like it is also their team. So like, you know, I, I do think that the way that Antonio says it is like, you know, let's, sh let's share this. But again, but with all that being said, I still want a team for Vancouver. Um, and so that still hasn't gone away. So even though like, yeah, I'm, I'm not bitter anymore that the team moved to Memphis, I still want a team for Vancouver. Well, you hear every NBA player say their favorite city is Vancouver. Yeah. And I think it's yeah. really coincidental 
that the uh, the day I think after your premiere is supposed to be this expansion announcement for the NBA. And so here's hoping, here's hoping. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that would be amazing. I, I mean, Seattle deserves a team for sure. Yeah. More like faster than we do, you know, it, if I had it my way, it'd be Vancouver, Seattle, but I know yeah. Vegas is like, it's probably you know, Vegas, in yeah. that, in the, in the rink. Yeah. Um, but uh, hopefully one day I, I am hopeful, um, but we just need, we just need the financial backing. So that's the, that's the only thing. And my last question is, um, did you get everything out of this documentary that you went into when you set up the, to do it? Did you get everything out of it that you wanted to get? I think so. I got, I think I got that and more. Like I, yeah. I, uh, I didn't, I didn't know what would happen in Memphis. Um, but I do feel like I got the closure that I needed. Um, and, you know, we got, we got, we got, you know, I was able to talk to Stu. I was able to talk to Steve. I was able to talk to Sharif, Country, Bibby. Like those are the main guys that like I yeah. needed for this film and we got all of them. Um, and we, you know, I'm very grateful for all of them for taking the time to sit with like a f childhood fan of the Grizzlies um, and to, and share their stories. So I, I would say, yeah, I got everything I, I, I wanted for this. Well, I really appreciate you coming on and I appreciate you putting such an exclamation point on this history in Canadian basketball, which is continuing to grow. And this was a chapter I think needed a lot of answers. And I think you did that with this documentary. It's my favorite I've seen in a long time. And even being a Laker fan compared to the Laker documentary that just came out, this is far superior, my, in my opinion, just of answering questions. So thank you so much for what you did with this documentary and look forward to everyone getting a chance to see it. Thanks so much for the kind words, Joshua. And thanks for having me. Cheers, everyone. You're listening to the Fresh Take Network, SIP interview exclusive.